In March 2011, a massive tsunami hit northeastern Japan, causing extensive damage to coastal communities. The city of Minamisoma was one of the worst hit. Here in this rich rice growing community in northern Fukushima prefecture, the once fertile land was poisoned with salt water from the tsunami. Now all that grows here are weeds. In an effort to revive the local agricultural industry, research is underway to develop a promising new crop. Leading the program is Professor Makoto Watanabe from Tsukuba University. At this facility in Minamisoma, a large pool sits where rice patties used to be. In the murky water are billions of tiny living organisms called microalgae, aquatic plants with a huge potential. Adjacent to the pool is a facility where the algae are collected and processed. In a series of steps, the algae are removed from the water and pressed into a paste. The substance is then put into one end of a machine that looks like it belongs in Frankenstein's laboratory. After 30 minutes, algal sample converted into the crude oil. Did he say crude oil? To prove it, Professor Watanabe opens a tap at the other end of the apparatus and out comes a thick, dark, gooey liquid that not only looks like crude oil. So the, uh, the, the real crude oil, oh, oh, black crude. And yeah. this smells like yeah, crude oil. Yeah, <laughs> to prove his point further, the professor lights it like a candle. Yep, this is crude oil, all right. Black gold, or should I say, green gold. The facility is the first in Japan to have turned simple algae into crude oil. The time has come for us to stop using fossil fuels, but the world will still need liquid fuel, and I believe that algae could become the main alternative to petroleum. In this episode of JTAC, we explore Japan's pioneering attempt to produce green and clean energy from an abundant and perfectly renewable source. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Marc Carpentier. We live in a world with finite resources, and that is especially true when it comes to fossil fuels. Not only are supplies limited, but when they are extracted, refined and utilized, they are highly polluting to the environment and are a major contributor to global warming. For decades now, scientists around the world have been searching for alternative fuels that are carbon neutral, meaning that the amount of carbon dioxide these fuels release into the atmosphere is equal or less than the amount of CO2 absorbed by the organisms that went into making the fuel. These carbon neutral fuels are also called biofuels. They are made from the natural hydrocarbons contained in plants. The most common oil for fuel producing plants are corn and soybean. However, growing grains and seeds for fuel is leading the world into a huge food crisis. We have to find an alternative to these food crops, and that could very well be algae. Microalgae are tiny aquatic plants that live and proliferate in waters all around the world. They contain oil, and a lot of it. In some cases, more than half their body weight is oil. Algae for fuel makes sense for many reasons. They are abundant, ubiquitous, relatively easy to culture, and they're perfectly renewable. All they need to grow is water and light, and in some cases, not even light. There is no doubt in the minds of people, governments, and business leaders that biofuels are the answer to our growing energy needs. The big problem with algal oil for biofuel is that it's extremely costly to extract and process in quantities large enough to satisfy global demand. So the race is on to find a cost-efficient way of turning oil from algae into petrol for our gas tanks. To find out more about the subject, we met with Professor Makoto Watanabe, who is a leading scientist in the field of phycology. Tsukuba University in Ibaraki Prefecture is where Professor Watanabe conducts most of his research. For more than 40 years, he's been studying the antiseptic qualities of algae to purify water in lakes and rivers. He's already collected samples of more than 5,000 types of algae from around the world. Among the many species he's found in Japan, there's one that caught his attention. It's called Botryococcus. 
These microalgae produce oil with petroleum-like qualities, something he'd never observed in all his years of research. He refocused his research from the pharmaceutical properties of the algae to their potential as an alternative to fossil fuels. Most species of algae don't produce petroleum-type oil. Usually, what comes out is only vegetable oil. Botryococcus grows in temperate freshwater rivers, lakes, and ponds at temperatures above 20 degrees Celsius. Like many other species of algae, it depends on carbon dioxide for food and sunlight for photosynthesis. Watanabe has so far identified more than 200 types of Botryococcus. He's searching for the type that produces the most oil. By varying the temperature and light intensity and using cloning techniques, he's trying to create an ideal strain. Here is a look at a promising strain grown by Watanabe, as seen through a microscope. The green-colored substance inside the cells is chloroplast, which contains chlorophyll for photosynthesis. Under pressure, the cells excrete oil. The amount of oil produced by this strain represents more than 70% of the algae's dry weight. So these algae are literally living oil factories. To study the algae's feasibility as a fuel crop, Watanabe has to cultivate them on the larger scale. He knows this could be difficult and very expensive. First, Botryococcus is vulnerable to contamination. It dies quickly in the presence of bacteria and other aggressive strains of algae. So it must be isolated from the environment and grown indoors. Also, it needs a lot of light for proper photosynthesis. Electrical lighting is too expensive and offsets the environmental benefits. And it needs to be kept at a temperature above 20 degrees Celsius to grow. That means high heating costs, especially in cold climates. Cultivating the algae in greenhouse conditions did lower costs by about one-tenth, but that was not enough for large-scale production. <laughs> Professor Watanabe also focused his attention on refining the oil produced by the Botryococcus. The first step was to dry the algae out in the sun for three days. The dried algae are then soaked in an organic solvent called hexane. This breaks down the cellular structure of algae and releases the oil. The oil and hexane mixture is then run through a device called an evaporator. The mixture is placed inside a vacuum flask that is rotated to facilitate the evaporation of the hexane, which slowly concentrates the oil. The flask on the right is the oil extracted from the Botryococcus. It has almost exactly the same composition as conventional crude oil. It still contains some pigments that give it a dark brown color. When the process is repeated, it produces a transparent fuel. Watanabe called this fuel botiococcine because its composition is similar to that of light oil or diesel fuel. In March 2014, the professor and his team tested this biodiesel fuel in a car by mixing 5% of botiococcine with standard diesel fuel. It became the first successful test on a car using biofuel derived from algae. The technology is promising, but it has one big limitation. Botryococcus doesn't grow well in water below 20 degrees Celsius. It's difficult to cultivate throughout the year in a country like Japan. The cold winter here means greenhouse mass production might not be a viable option. So Watanabe collected and studied saltwater algae of the types that didn't need light and heat to survive. Compared with freshwater, seawater contains a much greater number and diversity of algae, many of which have yet to be discovered. The professor zeroed in on a strain he had found in 2010 off the coast of Iriomote Island in Okinawa Prefecture. This particular type produces high concentrations of hydrocarbons. It's called Orantiochytrium. Watanabe cultured this strain shown here in an orange-colored solution. Orantiochytrium belongs to a group of algae called diatoms, which includes kelp and brown seaweed. Contrary to freshwater algae that need light, heat, and CO2 to grow, this one lacks chloroplast and grows by absorbing organic matter instead. 
As with Botryococcus, it produces oil rich in hydrocarbons, though in much smaller amounts. But what it lacks in content, it makes up for in number. Watanabe focused on the algae's ability to grow fast. The potential of this algae was way beyond our expectations, way beyond. Watanabe cultured Orantiochytrium in the laboratory. He fed the algae organic matter in the form of glucose and amino acids, which give the culture solution an orange tint. As they grow, the algae are moved to larger containers, fed more nutrients, and the solution is agitated to stimulate growth. The solution eventually acquires a milky color and turns lumpy. Here's what the lumps look like under the microscope. In very little time, the algae have grown and multiplied. It took a week to reach critical concentrations with Botryococcus, whereas here, with Orantiochytrium, it took only two days. But Orantiochytrium, too, has serious limitations. The nutrients needed to grow it are expensive, and it also requires a large-scale facility to cultivate it. Watanabe thinks he may have found the perfect solution to overcome this challenge. The infrastructure might already exist in the form of sewage treatment facilities. That's because the primary water produced in the process of treating sludge is rich in nutrients. Watanabe believes growing Orantiochytrium in tanks filled with this water could solve the problem of the high cost of nutrients like sugar and amino acids but he would have to eliminate the germs and bacteria contained in the water. We still have to overcome many technological obstacles to cultivate algae in tanks. One is sterilization, and then there's the unavoidable question of achieving lower costs. We're now in the process of developing such a system. It should allow us to reduce the cost dramatically, but we still need a bit more time. Extracting and processing oil from algae is costly, and that's why biofuels are still very expensive. After years of research, the cheapest biofuel scientists can produce is still $40 a liter, way too expensive to be commercially viable. The problem is complex. The algae need to be mass produced in controlled environments. It takes big infrastructure like growing factories, electricity for lighting and heating, and feed for the algae. Then more technology and electricity for the extraction process. Researchers are still looking for the best and cheapest way to produce algal biofuel. One Japanese scientist believes he might have the answer. The Tokyo Institute of Technology in Yokohama is home to the Center for Biological Resources and Informatics. This is algae. It's been dried. Of course, it doesn't burn by itself, but when we put it over a flame, it catches fire. One spoonful will burn for about one minute. That's because more than 50% of this genetically modified strain is oil. Professor Hiroyuki Ota leads a research project on genetically modified algae. He manipulates the algae's DNA to make it produce more oil. He's been studying a genus called Chlamydominus. This green algae consists of unicellular flagellates found in freshwater. DNA manipulation of these algae is relatively easy to do because they are single cell organisms. These algae are known to produce more oil when they are deprived of nitrogen on which they feed for survival. But the nitrogen deprivation also destroys the chlorophyll the cells need for photosynthesis and reproduction, which leads to their death. He wondered what would happen if he deprived the cells of phosphorus instead, another element on which they feed. He found that the cells again synthesized more oil, but the chlorophyll remained intact and the cells kept on growing. However, they also produced more starch as a carbohydrate, which contaminates the oil. When he applied this technique to another type of unicellular algae called nanochloropsis, he found that the cells didn't react to the phosphorus deprivation. This type of algae was chosen initially because it didn't produce starch. 
Nanochloropsis is a common genus found in ocean waters around Japan. The cells measure two to four microns across. Under a microscope, they look like round, translucent grains. The green matter inside the cells is the chloroplast containing the chlorophyll. The parts in blue are oil and represent about 5% of the cell's contents. Oto wondered how he could get the nanochloropsis algae to do the same as the Chlamydominus and react to a phosphorus deficiency. He experimented with a particular gene. Upstream on the Chlamydominus DNA strand are genes called promoters. They activate another gene called DGTT4 that stimulates the production of oil. Ota focused on a promoter called SQD2. I wondered if SQD2 would work as a promoter. The results showed that a phosphorus deficient environment does indeed stimulate the gene. Ota applied this theory to manipulate the DNA of Nanochloropsis, hoping that the phosphorus deprivation would trigger the same reaction. He took the sequence of the SQD2 promoter and DGTT4 from the DNA of Chlamydominus and used it to overwrite the same sequence in nanochloropsis. Ota's hunch was that this particular sequence would stimulate nanochloropsis to produce more oil and without the unwanted starch. He was right. Here's the result of this genetic modification on the nanochloropsis algae. The red areas show the chloroplast containing chlorophyll, while the oil is highlighted in green. When phosphorus is present, the SQD2 promoter remains dormant. Chloroplast grows, and there is little oil production. But by decreasing the amount of phosphorus, SQD2 acts like a switch. It activates the DGTT4 gene responsible for synthesizing oil. The genetically modified strain of nanochloropsis secretes nine times more oil than the original strain. In addition to the SQD2 gene, we could put other types of promoters into the gene sequence, which would not only increase the oil production, but change the properties of the oil itself. Then, by simply signaling a phosphorus deficit, we could make the cell produce different types of oil. There's great potential here. Imagine a living organism that produces ready-to-use fuel for the automotive and airline industries. Professor Ota's DNA technology, if applied to other types of algae, could raise the potential for the production of biofuel by reducing the cost of extraction and processing. However, that could be decades away. In the meantime, more conventional approaches are being used to extract oil from algae. One employs a solvent called hexane to wash out the oil from the biomass. The problem with hexane is that it's derived from refining petroleum, so it's not so efficient and is toxic. Another way is using a technique called hydrothermal liquefaction. This process mimics the way nature turns organic matter into petroleum. First, let me explain in simple terms how nature does it. Most of the oil we extract today comes mostly from prehistoric algae and zooplankton whose remains settled on the bottom of an ocean or lake. This organic material combined with mud and was then heated to high temperatures resulting from the extreme pressure created by heavy layers of sediment. Over millions of years, this material liquefied and its chemical composition changed to form the hydrocarbon-rich substance we call petroleum. Scientists and engineers have found a way to make petroleum in a matter of minutes. They've invented a device called a supercritical water reactor. It's a machine that uses high pressure and temperature to turn water into a powerful natural solvent that frees the hydrocarbons contained in a biomass. Professor Watanabe of Tsukuba University thinks this technology is still the quickest and most efficient way to extract crude oil from algal biomass. The agricultural fields in Minami Soma in Fukushima Prefecture were destroyed by the tsunami of March 2011. Salt deposits inhibited the growth of rice, the region's main crop. 
Professor Watanabe was contracted to build an experimental algae farm there to help revive the local economy. He uses a technique called hydrothermal liquefaction, or HTL, to turn the algae into oil. First, the pool water containing the algae is poured through a centrifuge to separate the algae from the water. This concentrates the algal mass. The mass is then pressed to remove most, but not all, of the remaining water. This produces a thick paste called sludge. The sludge is then put into a device called a supercritical water reactor, which will turn the sludge into oil. The concentrated algal sample uh, put in the HTL, and after 30 minutes, algal sample converted into the crude oil. Amazing. Yeah. And when you think yes, that yes. nature takes 30 million years yes, yes, to create fine. crude oil, yes. Yes. with this system, yes. you can actually do it in 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Do you want to see the crude oil? Yes, I'd love to. Okay, okay. Half an hour later, the professor opens a tap at the other end of the machine, and out comes a dark, viscous, and stinky fluid. Yes, it so the color that the real crude oil, oh. black crude. Yeah. And this smells like yeah, crude oil. Yeah, that. <laughs> True, honest crude, made with nothing more than algae. Professor Watanabe learned about HTL in 2010. It was at a conference called the Algae Biomass Summit in Phoenix, Arizona. There, he learned about the work of a New Zealander by the name of Rupert Craggs. Craggs demonstrated how HTL could convert algae into oil by mimicking nature using a supercritical water reactor. Watanabe went to Christchurch to meet with Craggs and see his operation. Craggs was growing algae in abundance year-round. This surprised Watanabe. New Zealand has a temperate climate, like Japan, with cold winters and warm summers. The key to Craig's success was that he was growing together a variety of algal strains, a system called polyculture. Watanabe realized he could do the same in Fukushima. To better understand how HTL works, Watanabe decided to enlist the help of his university colleague, Professor Mitsutoshi Nakajima, an expert in bioprocess engineering. Nakajima immediately understood from Craig's article that HTL relies on a phenomenon called supercriticality. At 374 degrees Celsius and 22 megapascals of pressure, water reaches a state in which it's neither a liquid nor a gas. But one step before reaching this state, it's in a phase called subcriticality where it takes on the qualities of a powerful solvent that can crack or break down the molecular structure of matter. The molecules then recombine under pressure to form complex hydrocarbons and polymers. Here's how it works. Organic matter or biomass that contains oil and proteins, such as algae, is placed in the reactor's chamber. The chamber is hermetically sealed, then heated and pressurized. As the water in the algae sludge approaches supercriticality, it becomes a solvent and begins breaking down the molecular structure of the biomass. The molecules recombine under high pressure over several times, creating the complex hydrocarbon molecules we find in petroleum. Of course, we're trying to determine why this happens, but frankly speaking, we have yet to understand it completely. This process of turning matter into liquid in a subcritical environment is what's called hydrothermal liquefaction. Professor Nakajima used a small-scale prototype reactor in his laboratory and refined the process by varying the temperature and pressure ratios over different periods of time. It took Nakajima two years to develop the larger model now in place at Professor Watanabe's experimental farm in Fukushima. Watanabe's experiments with oil-rich Botryococcus proved that this type of algae could only grow in the warmer months of the year. It was also sensitive to contaminants and therefore was not suitable for large-scale open-air cultivation. During his visit to New Zealand, he realized that the key to a constant year-round supply of algae was to use a polyculture method. 
the professor took us to an irrigation pond close by where numerous types of indigenous algae live year round. Well, I think the, this water contains the number of uh, green algae. I think the mm, more than 100 uh, algal species is contained, in, included in this water. In this bucket yes. here. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. More than 100 yes. species of yes. algae. Yes, yes. It's amazing. Yes. Here, one member of Watanabe's team is identifying algal species that are indigenous to Minamisoma. He studies their characteristics and rate of growth. He says cultivating a variety of coexisting species has an advantage. Some of these species grow during winter and others during summer. So on average, together they would yield a steady supply of biomass throughout the year. To accelerate the algae's growth, different supplements are mixed in the pool water to see if they could spur growth. Organic and inorganic materials are used, including catalytic agents like sodium acetate. This compound alone can double the growth rate of the algae. All the while, the professor checks cost performance to make sure the system can be viable as a business. At this point in time, with this method, Watanabe is able to produce 14 tons of local algae a week. This amounts to approximately two and a half tons of crude oil, or the equivalent of 17 barrels. Watanabe's ultimate goal is to build a larger and more efficient reactor, increase the production scale, and establish a new industry, one that would turn the fallow rice fields of northeastern Japan into productive oil fields. My goal, while I'm still healthy, is to produce one liter of bio oil for less than one dollar. I really want to make this happen. And beyond that, my truly ultimate goal, before I kick the bucket, is to free humanity from the constraints of fossil fuels. That is a noble goal. And if the results of research led by scientists like Professors Ota and Watanabe are any indication, cheap, clean and green fuel is within our reach. I'm Marc Carpentier. Thank you very much for watching. See you on the next edition of JTEC. Bye for now.